Good, useful examples was this one I mentioned earlier and pointed you to, where we're consuming a RESTful web service with a Xamarin Form application. It's a simple to-do app. Uh, it comes with the web service you can run separately or to just use their hosted service, but it's a read-only one in that case. But had some good, simple, simple XAML you could take and adopt. Uh, to make mine a little bit better, I uh, took some of the styles and so on from Ryan's. <laughs> And actually, my coach is a combination of the two, actually, in the end. Uh, so unfortunately, the, as I said, the emulators aren't working on this PC in the classroom right now, but I can run it locally. So I'll have to go back to the Windows Universal here. I'll set that as my startup project. And then I should be able to run it here in just a second. But before I do, uh, let's just have a little look at some of the stuff that we have here. So much of it is... I didn't even have to change hardly a thing. The same code, because after all, we're programming in C-sharp, supported by .NET, so all the repositories and everything that we did when we did our universal Windows app earlier on still work exactly the same way. And that's the beauty of it. It doesn't matter if in the end I eventually run it on an Android or a, well, in theory, I've never had a chance to test an iPhone yet, right? It doesn't care, the fact that the internal plumbing is done with .NET is all I need to worry about. So what we see here, right, there's my DAL, right, my department and employee repositories. Virtually I don't think I ended up changing anything in these whatsoever. No, nope. the code is all exactly as we had it before. Remember what we did is we were creating our custom API exception that allowed us to get the error feedback from our web API so if we're violating a uh, constraint of some sort, a referential integrity constraint, domain constraint in the database, or even just a validation that we've added through our annotations in the model, right? All that data will come back and we can wrap it up with this uh, custom API exception and then easily show it on the screen, right? So that's kind of nice that we were able to do that. Uh, the models are exactly the same ones that I use there as well for employee and department. Notice there's no point really adding much in the way of annotations other than the ones here for possibly serializing, right? Because you know, it's up to me to create the user interface. I don't have any helpers helping me do that in this case. But other than that, they're the same. I did, of course, make sure I included things like the byte array for the row version. So I can, in my client application, support the concurrency control, right, that the uh, backend web API has in place and so on. And, you know, I can still have my summary properties here, which makes it nice for summarizing information about, in this case, my employee on the actual interface itself. So much of this code is reused. I even have my, uh, uh, where did it go here? It's hiding. My API exception class, okay, same one that I used before. Uh, one of the things that did catch me a couple times, and I had to do some research and figure out why I was getting weird errors, you have so many different projects here, right? That maintaining the NuGet packages, okay, basically the installed assemblies across all of them can be a little tricky. So let me just share something with you before I go on. Under tools, of course, you should find NuGet package manager and uh, this option here to manage the solution packages in the solution, right? So when you come in here, of course, you would have had to do this to add initially our web API client, right? So we can parse all the data coming from our web API. Um, but you see, I've got 11 updates waiting for me and three consolidations. <laughs> but right now it's working. I don't want to mess with anything. So uh, installed, you can see all the different ones that are installed. But uh, let me just, I'm not actually going to do it, but if I were to uh, select this one, right? Notice that how you individually can check off which ones you're going to include it into if you do an upgrade or a consolidate or anything else. So I got into a real issue at one point with these weird errors about the version of a, some DLL referenced in the package manager does not match the actual D, uh, version number of the DLL being used and things like that. And the solution eventually was for the most part to come in here and check off everything. I usually left out the iOS one for now because I wasn't using it anyway but check off everything else and make sure you consolidate them all in the same version or just upgrade them all to the same version. If you have different versions in different uh, ones of your projects, even if it's in a project you're not accessing or trying to utilize, it will cause errors. 
Right? That's one little tip for you that I spend quite a bit of time trying to figure out why is this not working? Right? Okay. So that's good. Um, I'll leave that for now. Okay. So we have our other code, and that's great. So what I did is I also looked at my uh, app. Okay, my app itself. And here is where, from Ryan's example, we have all kinds of, oh, sorry, it's in the actual XAML. <laughs> all of these uh, styles that he did, lots and lots of work creating. So I kept most of them because most of them are very applicable and easy to use, right? I didn't keep all of them because some of them, you know, were specific things talking about uh, some fonts, uh, this magic font and so on. And I would have probably had to go and find something and install it to, to use that. I wasn't planning on using it anyway, so I just commented it out for now because, uh, it you know, you'll get error messages again if you reference things that aren't there, right? But most of his stuff I left here, and I found it fairly fairly useful in different places in my application. Now, in the code behind for, for app, I, again, this is not, I repeat, not necessarily best practice, but it works. And it's a similar poor man's coding approach that we used in our web API uh, earlier, right, in our client for that. I have my public list of active departments, right, so that I can store that in my app object kind of as a, don't say the word out loud and other programmers hear you, as a global, globally available resource. <gasps> okay, all right. And I also ended up doing this here as well because I figured if I'm going to sin once, I might as well sin twice. Uh, what this is, unfortunately, the navigation system in Xamarin Forms, it works very, very well, but we don't, by default, have those nice little events that we got used to using with our uh, Universal Windows apps, the on-navigated to events and on-navigated from and so on, right? So the navigation system itself, you can eventually, I found out, get in and actually make some custom event handlers inside the, you know, you have to make your own navigation page instead of using the default. So there are other ways around it, but in the end, I probably would have had to do this anyway for the way I was trying to do it because I had to decide when and when I didn't want to refresh going back to or navigating back to my uh, main page, when am I going to refresh the list of data from the web service, right? Obviously, on a cancel, I don't usually need to, right? Uh, unless I've canceled after a failed update. Because <laughs> what happens is it actually keeps the previous version of the model alive in the page unless you actually dispose of the page. So uh, anyway, there was a number of different spots where I had to decide do I need to refresh or not. So I found it easier just to stick this little Boolean okay, here right in the app. So, no, it's it's static, so it doesn't have much overhead really. Uh, oh, sorry, it's not static, but still, it's only a little Boolean, and uh, that way I can do it. I do have a few statics in here as well. Here's my static URL, okay, for my website. So I'm using the one I have up on Azure, the same one, okay. It, it's version two, you notice, because that's the one that has all the air handling code, right? Um, our Prog 1698 Web API two. <laughs> anyway, it works fine. It, it's working good. Okay, and down here I have my static API exception, right? So it works very fine in here. Nice, easy place to find it. And then these are all the actual uh, events built into the Xamarin Forms framework to help you maintain state and do certain code if it falls asleep or loses focus and wakes up again and so on. In case you wanted to write data out to an XML file, serialize data and bring it back into memory and so on. Okay, so those are the changes there. Now another change, uh, you might have remembered that we had our own custom methods for using a content dialog in the Windows approach, right? Um, because there was no message box anymore. Well actually, Xamarin Forms, in, it's one of the many ways that actually it works a little bit nicer. <laughs> we just have nice simple commands to do basically an alert or ask a question and so on. And we'll see that right here in my uh, uh, my code behind pages. All right, so I have two pages. Just clean up this a little bit because it's a small screen. Okay, I have my main page. Well, I should maybe start here uh, as usual, right? Uh, oh, in the uh, constructor for the app itself. Right here is where we create a navigation page. You have to start with the navigation page as the root, otherwise you don't get the navigation system. 
we touched on that before. It was also in that other tutorial. So our main page, instead of just loading main page, I load the navigation page and pass it main page, essentially. And then that's in the root of the navigation system. And I can go forward. If I want, I can show the uh, little back button, arrow in the top left, and then just step back through and so on, right? So that's the first thing here. So then let's come to main page. So what I threw on here, okay, I took advantage of this. I, I saw in the uh, to-do example that we talked about. So it has a nice little feature here for the page itself. You can give it a title. So in the little bar at the top, right, you can have the title there as opposed to taking up space in the page itself. And I decided to show the navigation uh, bar at the top so uh, you see the little back arrow and everything all the time, right? And then also from the to-do tutorial, I thought, oh, this is a neat idea. Toolbar items, okay? So that goes right in that top bar, same place as the title. So I added my plus there for adding a new employee, right? And I just had to make sure I grabbed this image and put, I only needed two copies, one in the resources drawable folder for the Android project and one just in the root of the project for the Universal Windows app, right? And I just copied over that as an existing item into those two folders and then it finds the little graphic for the plus symbol with no problem. Okay. so. Nothing else really needed here. Oh, that's another difference. I started off assuming I was going to need my value converters because most of the tutorials I saw also referenced the fact that uh, the Xamarin Forms namespace has iValue converter. Mind you, the uh, arguments you pass are different, <laughs> uh, but you know they do have the same concept. So I figured I would need it just like we did for you know converting things like the date time and converting things like uh, currency values and so on. But it turns out you don't. I mean, <laughs> you, you could. You could use it, especially if you do want to have dollar signs and show on, so on showing. But if you can live without a dollar sign, then you don't actually even need an iValue converter. Actually, that's one of the ways Xamarin Forms is quite a bit easier to implement than even our universal Windows approach. OK, so I skipped those altogether. Otherwise, it would have gone up in here, right? OK, so then I have my content of the content page. Just use the grid for the overall layout here. Well, I commented out this because I decided to show the uh, title up in the actual title bar at the top, right? So I just, I could get rid of that out of the stack panel. Now, here's something to talk about, a picker. You will notice that there's no such thing in Xamarin Forms as a drop-down list. Instead, what they have is a picker. So it is definitely a difference, and it, it probably was the biggest uh, change in terms of actually getting the controls up and on the screen. Uh, the picker control, I don't blame them. You know, if you think about all the different platforms to create a custom control that will work across all of them, it's got to be very, very challenging with all the different styles of sort of drop-down combo boxes out there across the various platforms. So the picker is a very minimalist approach. It has a items collection, basically, and it's only strings. And that's it. You do know an index of which item is, you know, you're selected and so on. But there's no, like, internal values, right? So you can't, like, grab, you know, from the selected value to find out the primary key integer and so on and so forth. And there are no bindable, I repeat, no bindable properties to the picker, okay? So, you know, when it comes to actually using it for representing a foreign key, you have to do some manual work. You got to roll up your sleeves like the good old fashioned days of programming that we used to do before we had such things as binding. Have you ever done that style of programming where basically you have the data maybe in an object perhaps or some, some collection that you can work with and so what you do is you go through and you write the values into all the controls manually as the form is getting ready to be displayed and when you're done saving you read all the data out of all the controls copy it into the object and then send it on its merry way to be updated or whatever. Everything else is bound, but the foreign key is not because I wanted to use the nice picker control. It really does look good and works well and so on and so forth, right? So anyway, so we have our picker. Notice we do have an event, okay? It has a title, which you may or may not use. I didn't use it on the details page because it just takes up room and kind of useless there. Uh, but I do have a selected index changed event. So I can use that to do some coding when it changes, right? Other than that, it's an extremely simple form. Look at this, a list view. 
And most of the tutorials you'll see use an example of a uh, view cell, right? For each, inside each data template. View cell just basically means build your own, right? And so you can use stack panels in there and have images and you know whatever layout, however you want. Very flexible and so on, but you know what? Looking at how we did our example last time, we just used on the main list two pieces of information. The concatenated full name and what we called as a summary property our employee class position, right? Which was the job title and a comma and the name of the department. So that's available right there in the employee objects already. And it just so happens that Xamarin, among the different cell types that it has, has this cute little one called text cell, right? So with a text cell, it has two properties, text and detail. <laughs> so it's already a predefined layout with different font colors and sizes and so on to show you the you know, larger letter text and then underneath a smaller uh, font detail. Perfect for exactly how I displayed it before. So I don't have to worry about all the stack panels and laying out this and binding that, right? Uh, I just set the binding for the two binding to the full name and binding to the position properties of the employee object. Okay. All right, so there's no X binding and stuff like that to, to concern ourselves with. It's just straight binding in, in forms, uh, in uh, XAML forms. So let's have a look now at the code behind for this page. Or do you want to see it run first? Okay, all right. No, I don't mind. Uh, let's go back to the local machine so it'll actually work. I'll pause while we wait. All right. Okay, so <laughs> uh, just, just for the recording, I'll quickly run it again. So we do have our filter working using our picker, right, and using the selected index changed event. We can bring up individual records, edit everything. The picker this time, of course, is not data bound, so we have to manually grab the new value. So if we move Tim Stovell uh, to marketing and do a save, right, then if I go to marketing, there's Tim Stovell right there, right? And I can click plus, create a new one. I don't have a delete option. I also change the caption at the top, and away we go. Okay. All right, and our validation is all in place as well. So let's have a look at a couple of those issues that we just talked about. Okay, so first of all, on our main page, so we have our, our picker, right? So how do we get the data in there in the first place? So let's go to the back, back in code here for the main page. Um, so what I'm doing is I have a reference to the uh, app Okay, so I can globally access it throughout my code here. <coughs> All right, so then I just grab it here, okay, to get the application.current, so I have a reference to my app object, right? And I'm setting initially my, the, the uh, we need employee refresh to false, okay, because I'm going to go get it automatically because I'm initializing and creating this page for the first time. So the on appearing event happens every time this appears on the screen. It's kind of too bad we don't have a way to know whether we've navigated to it coming back uh, through the stack of pages in the navigation system or going forward, but we do have this on appearing and it's quite useful, right? So don't forget to call base on appearing because we are overriding. <laughs> I left that out at one point, it took me a while because I accidentally deleted it as I was copying and pasting stuff around. I figured out, oops, that's not a good idea. So I'm calling my show departments, okay, which we'll get to in just a moment. That's the code where we populate the drop-down list. Nah, the picker, I should say, okay, on the main form. And then deciding whether the employee needs to be refreshed or not, we call refresh employees. Else, uh, I'm setting it to visible true. You might say, why am I bothering to make my list view visible and not? I just found it bugged me that you know, I would come back, the page would appear with the list, but then it would refresh, so it would disappear and reappear. And it was a little disconcerting. So what I did is I, I set it so that whenever I navigated away from the page to go to the employee details page, I would hide the list. So I wouldn't show it again until it was refreshed. It just it, it avoided kind of a flicker effect on the screen. I don't know if it would do it on an iPhone, but it did it on both Android and Windows. 
So I figured, well, no, I'll just make it not visible until it's, if it needs to refresh, then I'll, I'll let it refresh first before I show it. So it doesn't look like it's going whoop, whoop, right? Okay, so that's all there is to the on appearing. Uh, let me uh, just come down here to our show departments then, right? That's the other thing that we do when we first load up. So first of all, I want to make sure, do I have, I got departments yet from the web, right? From our web API. Now I have to confess, there's a couple of assumptions I've made here, okay? First of all, I'm assuming that the departments changes very infrequently. So I'm only actually refreshing it when I first load the application. Because it, it's almost a static list as far as we're concerned, right? Uh, I could, you know, take it further, add a refresh button or something, it would refresh everything like I did in the universal windows, but that's just one of the assumptions I decided to live with for now. The other assumption is that no two departments will have the same name. And I think I did put a unique constraint on in the database. I'd have to double check though as I sit here and think about it now. So that is important because remember, all we get in our picker are the string values, right? So if you had two departments the same name, we would never be able to tell because that's all I have is the name. I would never be able to tell okay, the difference between them. So those are two little assumptions that I'm, I'm going with and I'm gonna run with for this demo today at least. Okay, so basically I'm checking, do I have, have I already got the departments from the web API and stored them, right? If the count is greater than zero, then all I'm really doing down here is nothing. <laughs> okay, I'm good, I'm happy then. All right, otherwise I just create a new repository object. This is exactly the same code as we did it with the Windows approach. And then just wrapped it in a try catch, I just go and I get the uh, departments, storing it into my active departments, right? And then, that's fine, so that's good. I've stored it away in my app object, my globally accessible object here, my collection, but how do I get it into my picker? Well, manually, <laughs> right? So what I'm basically doing is, uh, for each loop, okay, looping through all of the departments. Now, notice I'm using a little bit of link here to put them in alphabetical order. Right, so I just loop through it. I can just do a link query to do an order by so that I add them alphabetically. And notice that I also manually added all departments first. Right? So I don't have to resort or anything. I just added it first so all the others will be added subsequently afterwards. Right? And that's it. So I just add each one to the uh, drop down list, which is a little deceptive, but that's the name I, I left it at. Okay, because it's really a picker, it's really not a drop down list, but you know what I mean. Okay. So that in the end populates the picker control with the all departments and all the actual department names sorted alphabetically. So I'm happy with that, right? Uh, by the way, you have to set the selected index back to zero so it goes to the top. Otherwise, it'll stay where you last added it when it appears on the screen. So that's all there is to populating the departments and getting the drop-down list for filtering up at the top of the screen. Okay, so let's next talk about, obviously, um, we're going to decide are we going to show employees or not, okay? So here is where we pass in a department ID, create a repository for the employee, and this is almost the same code as we did it before, right? So we uh, get our list of employees, and uh, if department ID actually has a value other than zero, right, then we use our get employees by department method in our repository. Otherwise, we just say get all employees or get employees, right? And at the end, we just set the employee list item source to the collection that we get from the web API. And then finally, I'm setting my visible property to true, right? Because I've, I've got my data, now I want to show the list, okay? Again, I just added that little twist there so that it didn't appear and then reappear as it, after it uh, refreshes. Okay. So that's that one, and then the error handling is pretty standard, same way we've done it. Oh, but here's that something I was talking about. Display alert, nice! So Xamarin Forms, you just say display alert, okay? And you just, uh, you can say okay at the end, right? Sorry, that's kind of a long one, um, okay? So you can have th uh, multiple arguments, three arguments, two I think is the minimum. Uh, it'll just assume, I think, the okay button if you don't specify it. Uh, but if you just keep on going, comma, and add another button, 
then it changes it so it wants to return Boolean true or false. They just pick the first or the second, right? So it's that easy to actually use it as a confirm dialog box. It's the same command. You just give it two options of buttons to choose from, and it will return a Boolean for yes or no. So that's much easier this way as well. All right. So uh, we've looked at the on appearing. Uh, so let's say our add button is clicked. Okay, so now we're going to go and, oh, I guess I, I put this, this is an intermediate step to refreshing the employees uh, because I wanted to call it from multiple places and I didn't always want to have to worry about passing a department, right? So I just call refresh employees first and then it looks to see if we have a department to filter by in the actual procedure I call, well, the one we looked at a minute ago, right? So I can call refresh employees and that way I go get the currently selected department. If it's all departments, then I call my show employees with null. Otherwise, I pass the ID. But how do I get the ID? See, this is the, the twist because the picker doesn't have an internal value, right? So what I do is I have to do a link query of my actual department's collection, the one that's stored in the app, okay, where the department name passes the name that's currently selected in the drop in the picker. Right, and then I uh, return the single one dot department ID. So that gives me the ID. Right, I have to do a query to go find out what the ID is for the actual department, and then I can call my show employees. Okay, and that way uh, I don't have to change anything in the repository. It's still just going to get an integer value for the ID to filter by. Okay, so that's how I handled that switch that you have to pass the integer, and all you know is the name. Okay. So we only have two choices here, employee selected. That means we've touched somebody in the list, clicked them, touched them, doesn't matter what. So as long as it's not null, right, then uh, we grab the actual selected item as an employee, okay? And then I instantiate the employee detail page and set this em one employee that was selected as the binding context for the page. Exactly the same approach is done in the to-do application sample. Exactly the same approach is done in Ryan's example as well. Okay, every page has a binding context. Right? It can be a collection or a single item. That's fine. Okay, so there's where I hide my employee list so that when I come back to this, it will initially be hidden, right? So it doesn't flicker. And then we do our navigation push async to the client page, the employee detail page which I've already set the binding context for this one employee we want to work with. So the twist on it is what if I'm adding a new? I don't want to select a current employee to edit. I'm just going to add a new one. Well, then I create a new empty employee, right? A couple things I need to do for plumbing. Uh, I decide to set the start date to today as an assumption, okay? Dates don't like being null, <laughs> especially if you're going to bind to them. So it's good to have a value there initially. So I said, well, hey, I'll assume you're going to start today and you pick a different day if you're starting next week, right? And I also found that I sometimes, actually, I could probably take this out now. I think it was a different problem, but I had kept on getting validation error messages on the SIN number. Uh, so I found by initializing it to an empty string, I got around those, <laughs> those errors I was getting. But after that, it's pretty much the same. I just, you know, instantiate my employee detail page at the binding context to my new employee hide my list and run off to the detail page. So it's in the detail page then that we decide or figure out are we adding a new or just editing an existing one, right? Same logic we used before. So that's pretty much it. We've covered, I think, everything in here, all the code. Okay. All right. So let's have a quick look now at, uh, no, at the uh, employee detail page. Starting with the XAML, it looks a little more cluttered, but again, I, I have a default title, but I change that in code anyway. You'll never actually see this one anymore if you change it in code, right? Uh, so basically, <coughs> my content, I'm using a scroll view just because <coughs> you never know how big the device is going to be when you have a lot of controls, possibly. Okay, if it's a small screen, you know, <laughs> you'll want to be able to maybe scroll up to get to the controls at the bottom, right? So it's a good idea to use a scroll view in a situation like this. Other than that, it's just a bunch of stack layouts. OK, 
Okay, basically I've got a you know set up here for first name, last name, job title, and so on. But notice these are all just entries. Okay, entries are really nice control uh, that works quite well. And the bindings then are just to the actual properties of an employee, right? First name, last name, job title. And you see there's nothing special required for salary or SIN number or anything like that, right? Okay, so here's my picker for the department. Okay, still using the same name, I'm allowed to do that, it's a different page. <laughs> okay. <coughs> and uh, all this does is it sets the size and the width and so on, so that they're all uniform size. That, that's one of the uh, static resources I borrowed from Ryan's solution. <coughs> Okay, and then here, uh, you could probably get away without all this, but the example I found first for the uh, uh, date picker had all this in place. I'm like, oh, that's good. I might utilize all of it, right? So basically, all it we really need is the uh, um, binding here for the date to the start date of the employee. And as a bound object, then I don't have to worry about it, and I don't have to, <laughs> there's no converters required. It just works nicely with the date time, data type, and away we go. Uh, the rest of this is just so that I can actually set a minimum and maximum date. It is considered good practice, uh, you know, because you don't want to have too large a date range that's unreasonable for some poor little, you know, phone to be trying to create a, a list going back to the beginning of time type of thing. So come up with reasonable values. I could actually, you know, say, well, obviously 2000, right? We aren't going to record any employees. The company when we started in 2005, <laughs> right? So that's good for a minimum date. And for now, I have a maximum of 2050. Okay, that way I can, if they haven't paid me any money between now and then, I can charge them to come in and update their app for them. You see, but developers, you have to think about this. It's like guaranteed obsolescence. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Question. Can you set the let's say maximum or minimum? Oh, of course you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You absolutely can. Um, <coughs> actually, the uh, <coughs> sample code I grabbed this from, the binding actually got from the sysdate sys, uh, dot now, right? So you could do the same thing. <coughs> okay. All right. So that's it for the date picker. Then I just have three buttons at the bottom. Again, I I borrowed a, a style from Ryan's example, nice big wide buttons. They look pretty good, so I didn't mind them at all. And they're at the bottom. So that's it for the actual XAML. So let's look at the code, because here's where much of the work actually happens, right? Okay. So again, I just have my references to the app, and uh, I created a, an employee object, okay, so to refer to the binding context, because that way I could manipulate it in different ways and so on as well. Again, our on appearing is very useful, right? So this happens whenever we uh, see the page. Now, of course, we're only gonna come at this one from one direction, from the main page, right? So there's no confusion that way. <coughs> so here I grab the binding context, save it as my AMP object, just for easy reference, so I'm not always saying binding context all the time, right? And I call set departments, we'll have a look at that in just a moment. So that's how I get the manually created list of departments in my picker my drop-down list, right? And here's my decision, am I adding or editing, right? Same logic we used earlier in the term, I check the ID, the employee ID. If it's a brand new, the ID is gonna be zero. If it's an existing record, it will actually have a value other than zero for the uh, employee ID as it's in the database as we know and integer identity, right? So then I can set the actual title for the page and uh, disable or enable my delete button because I don't want to try and delete a brand new one I'm just creating. And that's all there is in here. So let's, uh, I'll right click and let's go to definition for set departments. Okay, so here uh, I'm just getting a couple things ready. I could probably rewrite this code a little bit better, but I did it in a hurry late at night, so I haven't bothered re-looking at it. Basically, I'm for each looping through all my departments, the active departments collection that I have in the app object, okay? Again, I'm just making sure I get them in alphabetical order by the name. I don't want an all option here, okay? Why worry about it, okay? I'll, I'll, it'll be accounting or whatever the first one is alphabetically, but that's okay. They can change it, 
or maybe they are going to be in accounting the new employee anyway I don't know but you know that way I only have valid values in my picker anyway so that's just looping through adding them to the co items collection of the picker control and uh, this is how <laughs> I could probably come up with a better approach but it works as I go through and I'm adding each one I check whether or not uh, the actual department ID matches the employee's department ID okay oh you know what the one I'm adding that happens to be the actual department the employees in right so since I'm incrementing this little counter I know starting at zero okay zero one two three that's the index you know I know what index position in the items collection the currently selected employees department is <laughs> hey it works right okay so then I when I'm done adding all the data I set the selected index of my picker to my assigned department integer value right hey you know feel free to improve on this but as I said it does work all right so that sets our departments oh when I added a get department because when we're going to go back and save this right whether we're inserting or updating we still have to find out well what department was it and I need to know the integer value of the department right so I made a little get department method here so again uh, I grab the selected index, okay, and then from the items, I find the actual string value of the selected item, right? That gives me the name as a string of the department. So then I use that in my link query, okay, where the name, okay, matches, right? So I pull the actual department ID from my collection with a link query so I know the ID of the department. Just the reverse of what we did earlier. And then I return the actual integer value of the ID for the department that was picked out of the list. We have to do all this little extra bit of plumbing here just because we can't bind direct directly to the picker itself. Okay, so with that out of the way, and we know how to set up the departments and get the department, and uh, cancel, cancel's easy. All we do is navigate back, right? Don't, don't save anything, don't bother the database, that's it, just navigate back. Bada bing, bada boom. And uh, we looked at this already. So now we just have our two biggies, save and delete, right? And much of this code is very similar to what we did in our universal windows earlier. For saving, um, <coughs> again, entity framework, you know, we don't want to have a hierarchical object, okay? That doesn't work very well. So we clear out the child department object itself from the employee. All we really need to know is the foreign key value, the department ID, and then it can save and update it properly with Entity Framework. Same thing we did with the Universal Windows approach as well. But, okay, th I do need to have the department ID, and since it's not bound, there I'm calling my get department. Right? So that gives me the actual integer number of the department currently shown in the picker, in the drop-down list. So now I'm ready to go. So I instantiate my repository, okay, Again, I decide, am I adding or updating, right? So if the employee ID is zero, then I know I have to call the add employee. Otherwise, I'll call the update employee. And that's all there is to that, okay? But when I'm done, I'll have to set my need employee refresh to true. Because when I go back, I want to make, you know, I've just made a change, and it, it'll be static. It won't update it automatically, right? So I, I have to tell it that it has to refresh by setting this little Boolean flag. And then finally, I pop async back, okay, to the uh, calling page in the stack, which is my main page. So that's really all there is to that. Uh, just my catches here. Again, my API exception will fortunately have all the detailed error messages coming from my web API. And the beauty of, of this, again, is all I have to do is display alert to show all the messages. Okay, nice, easy, simple, built-in function supported by the page itself in Xamarin Forms. Okay, so delete isn't much different, although what I'm doing here is I have an if. I want to confirm, are you sure you want to delete this record, right? So there I'm here, I'm using display alert, but notice because I'm looking for an answer, did they click yes or no, we'd set it up, instead of just calling it, I use it in an assignment, calling it with an await still, Right, and I grab the answer that was returned. So the answer, notice as I ho hover over, it will be a Boolean. Okay. So you can really confuse people. If I put no here and yes there, then it would be the opposite. 
because <laughs> it actually goes by the position, right? It doesn't actually go by the meaning of the word. They're just strings as far as it's concerned. But here I am actually saying, are you sure you want to delete? Might as well make good use of the full name in the message that I'm showing. And I show yes and no as buttons, and that's it. So it'll return. If the answer is true, which is basically, I clicked my, the first button, the yes button, then I'll try to delete it, right? Again, same thing, just make sure you clear out the uh, child object, the department object from the employee. Instantiate your repository, call the delete method. Okay, tell that we need to refresh the list because we removed somebody, right? And then uh, navigate back to the main page. Our error handling is pretty much the same as it was. So that's really all there is to it. All right, so as you can see, it works fine here. I'd love to show you there. So I'm going to have to stop recording. We'll switch over to my laptop, and I'll show you what it looks like in uh, an Android instead of a Windows. All right. Okay. So, um, sending your employee object to the API, do you have to mess with the, uh, did you have to change the um, repository? No. So you realize that you just put as JSON into it? Yeah. Work? Yeah. So it might be, I might be messing a reference with my new system because I have to actually like, create a dictionary of uh, form and coded content and actually specify, okay, this parameter is coming from this. So I have to do it like the old school way, I guess. Oh, okay. So yeah, I'll, I'll get this code posted today as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, no, I, I just used the repository exactly as it was. I did have to make sure I went to the NuGet package manager and updated the Newtonsoft JSON uh, to the latest version. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. So it's working fine here. Um, so. I'm